Welcome to part 3 of my Anakin Skywalker character analysis. If you haven't seen part 1 or 2 yet, then I highly encourage you to do so. I'll throw up the title card and place a link in the description to it. In today's video, I'll continue my case for Anakin as the greatest Star Wars character, looking at his role in episode 3. So without further ado, let's get into it. Anakin then returns home and he and his wife discuss the news of their baby and their dream future together. Anna, I want to have our baby back home on Naboo. We can go to the lake country where no one will know, where we can be safe. I know the perfect spot, right by the gardens. Her desire to have their child on Naboo and live a happy life shows her hopeful nature, and how at the end of the day, she really only needs Anakin to be happy, which is what she calls back to at the end of the movie. This image that Padme has is where Anakin's mind should be focused on. But in the following scene, the premonitions of the future would begin to consume him. How they deal with these nightmares would begin to show how Anakin's experiences have made him fearful of taking chances and living the life of his dreams with Padme. You're so beautiful. It's only because I'm so in love. No, <laughs> no, it's because I'm so in love with you. So love has blinded you? Well, that's not exactly what I meant. But it's probably true. Anakin's thought process only furthers the idea that he's blinded by love. It's a romantic sentiment, but one that can skew his perception on reality. Throughout his life in general, he's always been one that simply follows that instinct. And in this case, to the point that it may blind him to what's actually important, forgetting why he does things out of love, further changing himself as a person in order to keep everything else the same. This is a subtle line that shows Padme's incredible ability to observe and read others. Also foreshadowing that Anakin will act blindly and use his love as a justification for his actions, rather than stopping and asking if his actions are doing more harm than good. Anakin begins to have nightmares of Padme's death, and similar to his mother, he begins to become obsessed with them. And because the same thing is happening again, it consumes his life and he wants to make sure that he doesn't make the same mistake twice. Failing to realize that not everything is necessarily a cause and effect. That some things are just out of your control. But that lack of control over fate only creates more fear. As the Chosen One has been raised to believe that he should be able to alter his destiny for himself and others for the better. No matter what. What's bothering you? Nothing. I remember when I gave this to you. How long is it going to take for us to be honest with each other? Anakin tries to deflect, as sometimes it's easier not to address the problem and ignore its existence. It's also a bit of the idea that he doesn't want to place any burden on Padme or worry for her. If he can, he'll try to deal with the problem on his own, failing to remember that they're a team. In the same way that he would be there for her in a situation like this, so would she. So, she reminds him of this. I made this for you, so you'd remember me. I carved it out of a poor snippet. It'll bring you good fortune. It's beautiful, but I don't need this to remember you by. It's also fitting that he reminds her of this as it feels like poetry that he has all these dreams of bad fortune and he gave her the necklace for the opposite reason. And even as an adult, similar to as a kid, he forgets its purpose. It doesn't possess inherent qualities that will actually help. It's like anything else. It's the thought that counts and what it means. In this case, as long as he's there for her, even when the bad fortune comes, then they'll be fine. Similar to his take on having a child. It was a dream. Bad? Like the ones I used to have about my mother, just before she died. And? And it was about you. Tell me. It was only a dream. Anakin hesitates to tell Padme because he knows, just like in his dreams, that once he says it out loud, it'll be like anything else. It'll be all the more real and he doesn't want to speak it into existence. You die in childbirth. And the baby? I don't know. It was only a dream. I won't let this one become real. Anakin doesn't want to shut Padme out, so he tells her. And when he does, the fear begins to creep in her too. And she tries to stay strong for Anakin, knowing that if he believes that these will become a reality and history repeats itself, that something much worse than what he did to the Sand People could transpire. Anakin also already confirms the idea that he will stop at nothing to ensure that this doesn't happen. But when he puts no limits to anything he would do, then it opens the door for madness to ensue. 
He starts believing that this is the good that he seeks, preventing what's out of his control rather than focusing on what he can and making that his reality. This baby will change our lives. I doubt the queen will continue to allow me to serve in the Senate. And if the council discovers you're the father, you'll be expelled. I, I know, I know. The consequences have been heightened as the product of their forbidden love may blow up in their face. Anakin understands this, but simply wants answers to their conundrum. Do you think Obi-Wan might be able to help us? We don't need his help. Our baby is a blessing. Here, we get a behind the scenes of how Anakin truly feels about Obi-Wan, as part of it is his own pride and inability to seek out help. But another part can be seen as his mistrust in Obi-Wan, as he may feel like he's too close to the council in this situation. Had Obi-Wan been more like Qui-Gon and separated himself from them and focused more on being Anakin's father figure, he might be more willing to confide in him in times of conflict such as this one, even though this typically would be a blessing, as Anakin states. Although Anakin claims that he doesn't need Obi-Wan's help, he reaches out to Yoda for guidance when he begins to have visions of Padme's death, showing that Yoda is still someone that he feels comfortable with opening up to and that he respects the wisdom that may be passed down to him. These visions you have, they're of pain, suffering, death. Yourself, you speak of, or someone you know? Someone. Close to you? Yes. Careful you must be when sensing the future, Anakin. The fear of loss is a path to the dark side. Here, Yoda makes a good point, as fear is what can cause people to do terrible things, as a clear mind is when you can make the correct choices in life, especially as Anakin has lived in fear of losing others his whole life. Death is a natural part of life. Rejoice for those around you who transform into the Force. Mourn them do not. Miss them do not. Attachment leads to jealousy, the shadow of greed. That is, train yourself to let go of everything you fear to lose. While it is true that death is inevitable, it's probably not the best advice for Anakin, as this is telling him to suppress the emotions that make him the good person that he is. He has more compassion than the average Jedi, which is why he wants to do his best to save others. From the clones in the battles, to Obi-Wan, and to Padme as when he's Anakin, he has people to fight for. As Vader, he's alone. Overall, Yoda shows that he's become a bit unempathetic and dogmatic, as he's preaching the idea that attachment is forbidden, something written in the code, rather than to embrace his compassion and to live in the moment. This feels like a big swing and a miss for Anakin, as he tries to open up to Yoda, but receives advice that more so avoids the problem, rather than trying to tackle it head on which only makes him further question the judgments of the Jedi Council as their wisest member's message doesn't quite hit home for him. Also to note, the shading in the room is a perfect representation of the conflict between the light and dark thoughts that Anakin is having, with just light being casted on his eyes, verifying that there is still good in him. But the darkness is beginning to take over. Anakin then meets with Obi-Wan, and is given news that would spark a recurring hesitation by his master about the Chancellor. What's wrong then? The Senate is expected to vote more executive powers to the Chancellor today. Well, that can only mean less deliberating and more action. Is that bad? It will make it easier for us to end this war. Obi-Wan has a clear concern for the consequences of giving one man, especially a politician, more power, as it may help out in the short term, as Anakin suggests, but at the cost of the long term. Obi-Wan strongly believes in democracy and for him to witness its slow downfall, he can't help but be concerned. It's a lot more difficult for Anakin to see the negative in his actions as he primarily places his faith in people, and the person he seems to trust the most is Palpatine. So for him, this is a complete win, not realizing that this gaining of power is a slippery slope that the Republic is heading in, similar to the opposite of what Obi-Wan would say as Anakin's allegiance is to the leader, not the Senate or the ideology it stands for, which makes him easy to manipulate in Palpatine's eyes. Be careful of your friend, Palpatine. Be careful of what? He has requested your presence. What for? He would not say. Obi-Wan's mistrust in Palpatine and politics is very clear here, as he doesn't even associate himself with being friends with Palpatine and shifts that on Anakin. 
knowing that their relationship is stronger than that of most working colleagues. For Anakin, this is difficult to see. He gives people the benefit of the doubt and wants to believe in their best intentions, where he sees his master as simply being cynical and overly critical. He didn't inform the council. That's unusual, isn't it? All of this is unusual, and it's making me feel uneasy. If it wasn't clear before, Obi-Wan does not like this one bit. Knowing that Palpatine is getting more comfortable with his seat of power politically, and with Anakin in particular, as he's pushing the envelope of what he could get away with. So, this is why Obi-Wan expresses his concern with Anakin, so he can go into his meeting with Palpatine with caution. Anakin is finally starting to see how things are a little off compared to the usual, but he's willing to hear out Palpatine's side of things before placing judgment, something he wished that others, like the Council, would have done for him growing up. Overall, this sets up the idea that while they may be approaching the end of the war, a greater threat still looms, and they need to look at all sides, as the vacuum of power may lead to betrayal from one of their own. I hope you trust me, Anakin. Of course. I need your help, son. Even the way Palpatine presents things to Anakin is from a place of innocence, as if a father is requesting something from his son. And that only fills Anakin with a greater desire to do whatever he's asked, as Anakin only wants to do him right and make him proud. Palpatine also calling him son is a form of endearment to truly gain his trust, as it's something that's always been missing in Anakin's life. And now, he gets a semblance of that from Palpatine. Anakin? I'm appointing you to be my personal representative on the Jedi Council. Palpatine accomplishes a lot with this one gesture, where he shows the greatest amount of trust in Anakin as he essentially states that he wants him to speak on his behalf to the Council. A great honor, especially from one of the most powerful men in the galaxy. So, Anakin says, Me, a master. I'm overwhelmed, sir. He understands the implication, and Palpatine will now pressure the Council to make a choice betting on the fact that they will make the wrong one and insult Anakin by denying him his dream. This move basically has no consequences for Palpatine, as it builds trust in him and distrust in the council for Anakin. This is really emphasized by the fact that Palpatine has always shown trust, faith, and belief in Anakin's abilities and character, always encouraging him. So to hear this from someone he looks up to, it means more because of it, where the council has not always done the same for him feeling like he's always been underappreciated by them. So this door that opens presents him with an opportunity for the council to meet him halfway, as they typically do things in favor of the Senate. Unfortunately for him, this time would be very different. But the council elects its own members. They'll never accept this. I think they will. They need you more than you know. Palpatine knows this, as the Jedi have become too prideful and arrogant to make the right choice here, and giving Anakin assurance that they should do it makes them seem all the more foolish in Anakin's eyes when they don't. Basically, Palpatine is continually trying to make Anakin think, why don't they see what Palpatine sees in me? Overall, this proposal gives Anakin a false sense of hope, and even though, like he already said, the council won't accept it, Anakin can't help but feel like he might be proven wrong. And when he isn't, it simply begins his questioning of the council and the order as a whole. And his frustration will only grow the more he thinks about it, and the more he becomes disappointed by them due to his own expectations. Disturbing is this move by Chancellor Palpatine. I understand. Anakin knows that this is a very unusual situation that's transpired. However, he definitely sees that it can greatly benefit him, further building anticipation in his expectation of the outcome. You are on this council, but we do not grant you the rank of master. What? How can you do this? This is outrageous. It's unfair. How can you be on the council and not be a master? Take a seat, young Skywalker. In this moment, Obi-Wan shows clear and visible disappointment in his pupil, as he failed what could be considered a test of humility and gratitude. While the council in some ways has disrespected him, he doesn't appreciate the honor that's been bestowed upon him that very few have ever accomplished. This going back to the same arrogance and pride he saw in his apprentice in episode 2. Anakin is outraged by the council's decision. It's definitely seen as a slap in the face in his eyes and even a lack of respect. To Anakin, he's done everything to warrant being granted the title. However, they still don't do so. And it, like everything else that happens to Anakin, is taken as a personal jab. 
almost as if they're doing so to spite him. And it doesn't help either that this comes from Mace Windu, a Jedi Master who has strongly represented the Jedi Council and its code, as well as someone who shows very little compassion towards Anakin whenever they interact with one another. Anakin is left in a position where he's left to steam in his frustration at the unfair hand that he's been dealt. This moment would be one of the most defining to Anakin's questioning of the Jedi Order and their entire philosophy, as he would feel betrayed by the people closest to him, only for it to be further highlighted in the next scene. What kind of nonsense is this? Put me on the council and not make me a master? It's never been done in the history of the Jedi. It's insulting. Oh, calm down, Anakin. You have been given a great honor. Obi-Wan reminds Anakin to look at the positive, where his apprentice is cynical and pessimistic. It's a reminder that sometimes we need to change our perception to something more optimistic and positive, as it's similar to how Qui-Gon said, Your focus determines your reality. It's because of this that it becomes so difficult for Anakin to see the positives in the situation. Rather, he's overwhelmed with negative emotion, and it becomes difficult to distinguish the good side from the bad, because he's no longer at calm, at peace, or passive. This again shows yet another example of how it can be difficult for Anakin to complain and vent just to let off a bit of steam, as Obi-Wan's first response is to simply calm down. His message afterwards is good, but it might not be received so well because the execution is asking him to simply get rid of the emotion. The fact of the matter is you are too close to the Chancellor. The Council doesn't like it when he interferes in Jedi affairs. What's important here is that Obi-Wan along with the Council is starting to keep their distance from Palpatine, as they rightfully should, whereas Anakin is still trusting him fully because of the emotional attachment and relationship he has to him. Also because Obi-Wan is the closest to Anakin out of all the members of the Council, he's the one they have speak for them on their behalf. This makes Anakin's distrust in the Council only become magnified and amplified onto his master as he's acting as their spokesperson, and in Anakin's view, it's as if he's defending their actions and taking their side rather than his own. I swear to you, I didn't ask to be put on the council, but it's what you wanted. Obi-Wan is willing to call Anakin out, where he knows that he's telling the truth, but not giving all the info. The fact that it's what Anakin wanted is important, because he wouldn't be reacting as passionately as he is if it didn't matter to him. So, Obi-Wan reminds him to own up to that. Anakin needs to understand that his ego and pride is causing a lot of this feeling of frustration, and once he accepts that, he'll be closer to finding peace with the outcome. Your friendship with Chancellor Palpatine seems to have paid off. The only reason the Council has approved your appointment is because the Chancellor trusts you. This is where Obi-Wan is put in a difficult situation, as he must be honest with Anakin about something that might not be easy to hear. He has to tell him that he's on the Council, not because of his merit, but because of his relationship with Palpatine, which of course will rub Anakin the wrong way, as even the one honor he was given was not because the Council believes he earned it, but because it would benefit them. If things weren't bad enough, they get worse for Anakin, and he begins to see the Council prove themselves to be nothing close to what he expected. This is a shot to the gut as he feels that the work he's been doing has been for nothing, as the Council have only accepted him because of the direct benefit Anakin serves to them, not because he earned it, like everyone else. And? Anakin, I am on your side. I didn't want to put you in this situation. What situation? The Council wants you to report on all the Chancellor's dealings. They want to know what he's up to. They want me to spy on the Chancellor. Telling Anakin this clearly makes Obi-Wan uncomfortable, as he knows he's now forcing tension with his apprentice as he's asking him to betray someone that he trusts. It also doesn't give the Council itself a good image, as their first mission for Anakin is to commit treason, which goes against the honor of the Code. Obi-Wan here must suffer the consequences of his negotiating skills, as he's being directly associated with the Council's plan, which is why he even goes as far to tell Anakin that he's on his side, because he doesn't fully agree with the decision himself, but must do it for the greater good. It's a testament to Obi-Wan's ability to do things to help others and take the fall. Similar to the idea presented earlier that he is always willing to sacrifice himself to save others. Where Anakin believes there is a clear right and wrong way of doing something like this. One day into being on the council and Anakin is already having to question the ethics of the council. A group of people he once idolized. But it's moments like this that they seem to follow the code when it suits them best. Not too dissimilar from himself. But in both himself and the Jedi, 
He holds them to the highest standard, so when he sees that they so easily break it, he's dumbfounded by the reality of their nature. If that's treason. We are at war, Anakin. Anakin is viewing this as an absolute, or as black and white, whereas Obi-Wan understands that this is a situation that they're in the gray. Their philosophies collide as Anakin is thinking purely ideally, and Obi-Wan believes that you have to crack a few eggs to make an omelet. Why didn't the council give me this assignment when we were in session? This assignment is not to be on record. Once again, the council is just off to a rough start for Anakin, as they're already operating in a shady manner, which only makes Anakin begin to have doubt in his own master. The Chancellor is not a bad man, Obi-Wan. He befriended me. He's watched out for me ever since I arrived here. That is why you must help us. While Anakin sees the good that Palpatine has done for him, he naively fails to see things from an outside perspective. So, Obi-Wan implies that Palpatine has a separate agenda, and that Anakin would be the best person to find out what it is, as he's the one Jedi that Palpatine truly trusts. Our allegiance is to the Senate, not to its leader, who has managed to stay in office long after his term has expired. The Senate demanded that he stay longer. Yes, but use your feelings, Anakin. Something is out of place. This, at its core, are the juxtaposing principles of Anakin and Obi-Wan. Anakin chooses to believe in people, where Obi-Wan chooses to believe in ideals. There's nothing inherently wrong with putting your trust in others, but people have agendas, and agendas can change. Whereas if you follow your own ideals, that can be unwavering, because it's a belief that you have and no one can alter. But in Anakin's defense, you must trust and believe in people, or life becomes impossible. Anakin's mindset is in line with this idea, as it's all that he knows. It's the only way that he can see things because he wants others to believe in him. So he treats them the way he wants to be treated, and does the same for them. He wants to live in a world where trust and teamwork can make anything possible, uniting people together for a common goal, not dividing whenever the opportunity arrives. You're asking me to do something against the Jedi Code, against the Republic, against a mentor and a friend, that's what's out of place here. Because he's never had full trust in the Council, or more importantly, they've never shown full trust in him, Anakin is hesitant and suspicious of their true intentions, while the opposite is of Palpatine, as he can ask Anakin to kill a man, and he does it partially because he trusts him. This shows that Palpatine focused on the importance of establishing a relationship with Anakin that is built on trust and care, where the Jedi only preached for him to do the right thing, but never spent the time to show him enough compassion, best exemplified by Mace Windu, a good man whose aloof nature and lack of empathy would constantly give Anakin the impression that he wasn't welcome. Why are you asking this of me? The council is asking you. This is a reminder of how Obi-Wan suffers as the middleman, where Anakin viewed him as a friend, he now sees him as someone who's asking the worst of him, which is why Obi-Wan must remind him that this comes from the council. He's simply the messenger. However, because it is Anakin, he can't help but feel hurt by his friend. This conversation represents the start of the end of their friendship, as Anakin can't help but feel betrayed and see Obi-Wan as a puppet of the council. But Obi-Wan sacrifices his own pride and image in Anakin's eyes to try to do what's right for the galaxy and establish balance in the Force. This showing how betrayal strikes Anakin even harder than the average person, as he views any disagreement like this as someone who's his enemy. And it's when the leading members of the Council discuss Anakin that a suspicion of their doubt in him would be confirmed to the audience. Anakin did not take to his new assignment with much enthusiasm. It's very dangerous putting them together. I don't think the boy can handle it. I don't trust him. The council shows even further distrust in Anakin behind the scenes, and it shows when they interact with him, so much so that they question if he even is the chosen one, doubting his potential. Is he not to destroy the Sith and bring balance to the Force? So the prophecy says. A prophecy that Miss Red could have been. Here, Obi-Wan begins to show further doubt in his apprentice, along with Mace and Yoda. Although, Obi-Wan simply poses the question because things don't look quite as nicely as the way Qui-Gon once presented it to him. But it's this moment of doubt that the Council expresses here that Anakin seems to feel from them on a daily basis, and has a great impact on how he perceives them. This also shows how Mace blindly follows the prophecy as he does the code. Yoda is willing to admit that they were all wrong as he's willing to learn from his mistakes, and Obi-Wan 
chooses to maintain faith, which is probably the most Jedi-like thing to do, as he's willing to allow the Force to decide their destiny, and he will maintain a positive outlook along the way. We may have our moments of doubt, but that's simply fear talking. So changing your mindset to believe in the positive, even if it doesn't seem likely, makes a world of a difference in how things will occur. So he chooses to take a page out of Anakin's book, and he chooses to believe in people. He chooses to believe in his apprentice. He will not let me down. He never has. I hope right you are. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. I had a ton of fun making this video, so if you enjoyed it too, then I highly suggest liking the video. And if you want to see more like it, then definitely hit subscribe. And if you want to be notified when part 4 comes out, then hit the bell for notifications. Or consider checking out my Patreon, where I'll be uploading videos there significantly sooner than on YouTube. So part 4 should be available there as I speak. And the same will apply to the next parts when they come out. And on that note, I want to give a shout out to my patrons. Your support means everything to me. And finally, let me know in the comments which Star Wars character has gone through the greatest fall from grace and why. And who knows, they might be in the next one. Until next time, I will bring peace, freedom, justice, and security to my new empire.